So Gary Talves, an investigative journalist who's been a game changer in the world of health and nutrition. From examining the high stakes of particle physics in Nobel Dreams to tearing apart sugar myths in the case against sugar, Gary has never shied away from questioning, questioning mainstream science. Today, we'll explore his groundbreaking work, dive into the murky waters of nutritional research, and even challenge conventional wisdom. Get ready for a thought-provoking conversation that could very well change the way you think about food, health, and science itself. Welcome, Gary. It's so good to have you here. Uh, thank you, Karen. It's so good to be here. <laughs> so I want to know, my first question, not a very challenging one. I heard that you wanted to become an astronaut when you were young. And... Um, <laughs> How and how did this happen? And when did you decide to switch to become an investigative journalist? Uh, okay, well, the, I wanted to be an astronaut because I grew up reading science fiction books. And that's what everyone, you know, this was also the 60s when, when the space program was the most exciting thing going. So um, I went off to college. I studied astrophysics because I thought that's what astronauts studied. I wasn't very good at astrophysics. I got a C minus in quantum physics. And my advisor suggested I find another line of work. And uh, then I went off to Stanford for graduate school. And I was actually still thinking about astronautics. And I lived with a couple of uh, naval pilots in this apartment building where we lived. And I thought, you know, I'm, I don't, I will never fit in in a regimented uh, sort of hierarchical organization where I'm supposed to uh, just, acknowledge that the people above me on the hierarchy know better. Plus, I was six foot two and 220 pounds, and I figured the world didn't need a 220 pound <laughs> astronaut because you could send up a 150 pound astronaut who's just as smart or smarter and a lot fitter and use a lot less fuel to do it. So that was the end of my astronaut dream. In the meanwhile, I read All the President's Men, the yeah. Pulitzer Prize winning book by Woodward and Bernstein about the Richard Nixon Watergate investigation. And I thought that's what I want to do with my life. So that's just kind of what I did with my life. Well, I love that. And then in 1986, you publish your first book, correct? Yeah. So um, I went up to journalism school. I went into science journalism because it was the only career that allowed me to stay in New York City, where my girlfriend lived. Um, I mean, seriously, it was that. It's what kids, how kids think. It was that or like oh, to Dallas relate. or actually uh, I got an offer from CNN to work in Atlanta and CNN didn't allow smoking in the newsroom. And I was a cigarette smoker back then. And when you're a cigarette smoker, you make decisions based on things, whether or not you can smoke. So I stayed in New York. I became a science journalist. And a few years into it, I realized that not all science was good science and began thinking critically about some of the stories I was reporting. And then in 1984, I went off to CERN, the big physics lab outside of Geneva, thinking I was going to be following a great physics breakthrough. Today, we would say that I was Im embedded with the physicists in CERN as they were following up on this supposedly seminal work they were doing. And while it was there, they realized that they had screwed up and how they had screwed up and that this wasn't the discovery at all. And I realized that the Nobel laureate who led this investigation had made mistakes like this throughout his career. In fact, some of the work that he got the Nobel Prize for was probably wrong. And the book I thought was going to be documenting a great breakthrough in high energy physics turned out to be something of an expose of the world of high energy physics and a learning experience and how hard it is to do science right. So this is a collaboration with 150 very smart people on it, and they still misinterpreted their data because wishful thinking, I guess, and the desire to discover something new and the lack of understanding of how easy it is to screw up, how easy it is that your equipment or nature can conspire to fool you. So that was the beginning of my learning experience in, in what physicists call pathological science. Was this so disappointing to you? 
No, it was fascinating. I had a blast. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's, you, you know, I'm 28 uh, years old. I'm living at the <laughs> physics lab. I'm hanging out with these physicists. I mean, it's a much more interesting story that it was wrong than it was right. If it's right, it's there's not that much you can learn from it. I mean, you can learn about the universe, which is a good thing, but there's not that much you learn about the scientific process or, or nature. So, um, and the dynamics at this physics lab were extraordinary. So there's, there's this huge accelerator, there's two major experiments on the accelerator, these big detectors that are like mansion size cameras, for lack of a better word. Um, the two experiments are competing with each other. They're both mostly composed of European physicists, some amazing, charming, brilliant characters. Um, the secondary experiment, those people are always happy to tell me how the people I was covering had screwed up their research or done it in the past. Um, I mean, I had people on the experiment itself, which divided into sort of two groups or the people who thought they had discovered something new, they were a minority. And then there was a majority of people who had actually built the equipment themselves by hand. I mean, this enormous, incredible high tech device they had built and they were all too aware of how easy it was to screw up how all the glitches that they might have built into it. And so you've got this sort of dividing line between people who only did analysis and didn't really pay attention to the nuances of their equipment and their apparatus and the, the experiment themselves. And then the people actually were in there building it and were aware that this was a not a perfect idealized device. So, um, yeah, it was fascinating. Plus, it was fun to be living in Europe, even though Geneva is probably one of the dullest cities in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, <laughs> boring beyond belief, but it meant I got a lot of work done. It's I had a line. How, how old were you at this point? I was 28, 29. And then I went and wrote the book in Paris. So, I mean, if, what young writer doesn't want that experience? Um, I had, how romantic. Yeah, no, it was. It's been downhill <laughs> since then. <laughs> Job. <Yeah. laughs> okay, wait, um, and then so that's like 1986, right? 84, 86. You're saying the next thing you delve into is in 93, or the next book you publish is about cold fusion and bad science. Okay, is so we, here's the thing. I have this book out. Nobel Dreams, which is kind of an expose about the politics yep. and sociology of high energy physics and the personalities. And the general theme is how easy it is to, to screw up, to get the wrong answer in science. So this becomes my obsession. Um, after I wrote the book, uh, it was interesting. Um, when the book came out, there was an article on page six in the New York Post, which is a gossip article where the Nobel laureate is calling a Nobel laureate is calling me a now 30 year old journalist an asshole in the New York Post. And I think my career is over, right? I'll never work in this town again. And instead, what I find out is that whenever I'm interviewing scientists, which is what I do for a living, yeah. and we get on the subject in my book, they'll say, oh, you think this Nobel laureate was bad? You should write about so-and-so or who's it? So there was somebody in every field, basically, who's similar to this guy who plays kind of fast and loose with the data who doesn't put enough attention to all the various, figuring out all the various ways that he can be wrong or she can be wrong, and that they basically go a long way in these fields because of their ambition and their political skills more than their scientific skills. Um, so I started writing articles about that. And then um, when cold fusion happened, this was a great sort of science fiasco of the second half of the 20th century, the great accepted science fiasco. Um, my publishers asked me if I'd write a book about it. And I thought at the time I was actually, I had moved back from Paris. I was living in Los Angeles, writing screenplays, trying to get rich so I could move back to Paris. <sighs> and I took this book as a way to fund my screenwriting career. And I thought it would take me nine months and I'd be able to um, 
bank enough money to write screenplays for a year. And instead I spent three years on the book because I tend to get obsessed about <laughs> things like this. And um, I thought of it as sort of the case study and the book was called Bad Science um, and the kind of case study in how easy it is to screw up and to misinterpret your evidence, your data and science and something that every graduate student should read as a kind of, um, you know, learning experience before they go into science as a career that as a, as a, as a warning, this could happen to you if you're not careful. Um, so by the time I was done with that, I <laughs> owed my father $40,000 uh, for, I had, got married and moved back to New York. My screenwriting career was over and the book got terrific reviews, including a long article in the New Yorker about it, not by me. And um, I was back in science writing, but now I had another fraud case I was working on or alleged fraud, I should say, from the cold fusion years. I was working for the journal Science, which liked my critical take on journalism. And I basically settled in as an investigative science journalist, stopped trying to get back to Paris. And, uh, and the screenplays never sold anyway. So, um, so that was it. And I've been doing that now for 30 some years. I guess it's 30 years since the Cold Fusion book came out. Wow. Almost well, exactly. That's incredible. I would love to um, read your screenplay, screenplays or know what they're about. No, you wouldn't. Really? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, let's not. Those let's are not dying. Those are that. dying with me. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they're pretty brilliant. Um, um, nope. Was They're not, not? One of my talents. I think <laughs> it's fair to say that one of my talents is not narrative skill. I, I'm a dogged reporter, and I tend to keep researching subjects until I. Yeah. Well, sort of. I'll give you an example of how yes. the research. So in cold fusion. So the cold fusion is this idea that you basically stick a couple of electrodes in a beaker of heavy water, which is water in which the hydrogen is replaced by deuterium, and you plug it into the wall, and lo and behold, you get nuclear fusion, which is the force that powers the sun. So on many levels, it was absurd, but the University of Utah in 1989 throws a press conference to announce the discovery of this cold nuclear fusion. If it's true, it's cheap, limitless energy, like the you know, no climate change, no petroleum politics anymore. It's cold fusion powering our cars and our power sources from here on in. Um, front page Wall Street Journal article and the science community just jumps into gear to try and figure out whether this is right. So in the course of my reporting, I realized that they, they were, I mean, it was clear from the beginning, there were two groups that claimed to have discovered nuclear fusion, the University of Utah and Brigham Young University, which is the you know, an hour south. Um, yeah. And um, the more I reported, it turned out that they, these two universities had made a deal to publish simultaneous papers. And the University of Utah had preempted this deal by throwing the press conference. So they had betrayed you know, Brigham Young and the deal had been made by the, I think it was president of uh, University of Utah, a guy named Chase Peterson, and he had made this deal with like his childhood best friend and cousin at Brigham Young University. And it, this guy, Chase Peterson, was famous for being one of the most honest, sincere, wonderful human beings you could imagine. I mean, this was his reputation. I mean, nobody had more integrity than Chase Peterson. And so I decided I had to keep reporting this until I understood why Chase Peterson would apparently betray his childhood best friend and cousin. And if I could get to the point that I could understand why Chase Peterson thought he had no other option, then I had basically done my job. And by the end of the you know, two years of research before writing, I finally understood why Chase Peterson had done what he'd done 
did, why they had no other option, and why, in fact, I completely understood why the, the University of Utah threw itself off a cliff with this press conference. Um, so it's a, that's the kind of you want to keep reporting until you understand fully not just what mistakes were made, but why they were made and why they would have seemed to be the right thing to do when they were made. Because one of the tenets of good journalism is you never assume that people are just more venal than you are. That like, you know, if you can't give me ten thousand dollars, or even I hope a hundred thousand, or a million, or ten million, and have me turn around and start saying things publicly I don't believe, so I'm not going to assume that you can do that with anyone until remarkable evidence sort of makes me, you know, think otherwise. Well, I learned something really interesting that I would make the worst investigative journalist in the universe. Um, but my question is, why did Chase betray his best friend? Um, the Brigham Young was trying to steal the what <laughs> so the University of Utah comes up with this mistake. They think they've created cold fusion. It go they send a proposal to the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy, the guy at the Department of Energy has been working on a different, very subtle and meaningless form of cold fusion with this guy at Brigham Young University. And the guy Brigham Young sees what the people at University of Utah is doing. And he says, well, I've been doing this also. And they basically try to steal it from Utah. And then they claim that there's no patents in this. So they're just going to go public. And as soon as they go public without filing patents, they're going to give up their patent rights. And the University of Utah can't have that happen. So the only way to preempt it is for them to file patents and go public first. Oh. And they, by the time they, as the wheels were churning closer and closer to this decision to publish papers jointly, they realized that they just had no choice if they wanted to save the patent rights, which the University of Utah is also is a state-owned institution, so the money yeah. is going to go to the state of Utah. And they felt that Brigham Young was operating in bad faith, and they had good reason to think that. And the fact that Brigham Young was trying to steal it from them had convinced them it must be real, right? Nobody tries to steal something from you that isn't. So yeah. all the scientists who were warning them that they had not, they didn't have enough evidence to make this kind of claim, the evidence they did have is that somebody was trying to steal it from them. So. Oh my gosh, fascinating. Yeah, it was a perfect storm of bad, bad luck and uh, duplicity and the University of Utah, which paid for, I mean, they ended up getting crucified for this kind of mistake. Um, there's really nothing they could do. I mean, they should have been better scientists to begin with. And the guys involved should have said, look, well, I don't care if we lose patent rights. We just, we can't go out with this, but they weren't. And they then succumbed to all these forces that were kind of beyond their control. And Chase Peterson turned out to be a wonderful guy. In fact, he had been the yeah. uh, the head of admissions at Harvard, and I was the last class that he admitted before he went Aww. back to the University of Utah. So, oh, I love that. Okay, we wait. Had a, we yeah. ended up spending about six hours together in his house in Park City before I, when he finally agreed to meet with me and. You know, I could tell him what I had and he could understand and then have the opportunity to understand, you know, and get confirmation of what he had concluded. Wow. That must have been quite, that must have been quite something, being able to meet with him in person to, to share I that mean, with him. Doing this stuff is wonderful. I mean, it's a wonderful, it's, um, 
there's a real thrill to doing this kind of investigation, this kind of research, where you're learning things that nobody else knows. I mean, except the people who are involved in it. But that's what science is about, right? It's about learning about the unknown. And there's a lot of parallels with investigative reporting. I mean, in any investigation, police investigations, you know, where you're always trying to uncover the unknown and make sure, do enough research so that you can have confidence that you have not screwed up which is all too easy absolutely okay i want to touch on your article fields of fear which was 98 so we moved from 93 and bad science to 98 no field Um, of fear was 93 94 oh i got it wrong okay 94 okay let's move to 94 fields of fear this is one of your yeah tell tell talk in writing the cold fusion book again i had this opportunity in both these books no bad dreams and and bad science to have sort of exquisite experimental scientists explain to me not just how to do what they were doing correctly but how these other people were not so basically you could think of it as getting mentored in how to do science right and getting mentored in how to recognize this thing they call pathological science which is a science of things that aren't so that's not you know in the in the news we're always reading about scientific fraud and misconduct which is where you make up data to claim you've seen something you didn't. Um, Pathological science, you don't have to make up data. You just have to do all the other jobs of science so poorly that you misinterpret the data you do have. Um, And uh, so these physicists that I was writing about, at the time there was this belief that electromagnetic fields cause cancer. And um, uh, you live close to these big power lines. There are higher rates of brain cancer, uh, brain tumors, wow. and leukemia. And so the idea was that the power lines may be causing it through some, and, and th- this <laughs> appears to be physically impossible, like it violates the laws of physics as these physicists understood it. But moreover, these physicists were looking at this research and saying these people don't have a clue how to do science right. They don't they're not critical enough, they're not rigorous enough, their methodologies are sloppy and lackadaisical, and they're making these claims that they simply can't support. And aside from that, the claims seem to violate the laws of physics. So since I had gotten to know these physicists well, they suggested I write about it. But my memory is that one in particular, a researcher at Yale, said if you're interested in bad science, you should look at some of this stuff in public health that's terrible. And then they kind of pointed me at this electromagnetic field story and let me do what I was now getting, you know, reasonably adept at doing. So I did. So I did an article for the Atlantic on the electromagnetic fields and cancer. And this is based on this science of observational epidemiology, where you're basically, you're trying to measure the strength of electromagnetic fields coming out of power lines and then you've got people living near the power lines or far away from the power lines and you're trying to estimate how much exposure they have to these electromagnetic fields and then you get an association between field exposure and um, cancer rates and then you assume that that exposure is that association is causal and that the increase in cancer rates are caused by um, these um, fields. And in doing this research, I was interviewing these epidemiologists, I was reading the papers, and the papers were, I mean, my physicist friends were just dead on. These people, all that I had learned about physics, about how rigorous and careful and meticulous and skeptical and critical you have to be and looking at your data and your equipment and all the, these epidemiologists just didn't do. It's like they thought of it as a kind of luxury that they didn't have to do. And I was kind of stunned by this. So when I finished the the electromagnetic field story that I did for the Atlantic, I then pitched a story to the journal Science, which I was now writing for on epidemiology in general. Wow. And this sort of anxiety, the weak syndrome, you know, every week, it's a little muted now, but back then every week you would worry about, you know, there would be a, 
the article in the newspaper about coffee has been causes cancer or uh, mm -hmm. hair shampoo causes baldness or you know, I mean, there was always something and it was like the anxiety of the week. And it came out of these particular studies, these sort of epidemiologic surveys. And so I wrote a, a piece for science on that. Again, I interviewed 30 or 40 epidemiologists about how bad their field was. One of them, a uh, wonderful uh, Greek epidemiologist at Harvard later commented when my story came out, he said, you know, Gary, it's like when you're telling your, your mistress about all the things you don't like about your wife, um, yeah, they may be true, but you don't want it to come out in the newspaper the next day. <laughs> um, but uh, that was a kind of infamous article, the epidemiologist, still like a year ago, there was a big article written trying to refute the claims I made in 1994 in mm -hmm. science. Um, so it's been cited about a thousand times in journals. Um, anyway, that got me into public health. And I, five years later, I or four years later, I moved into nutrition and I've never been able to get out. So yeah, and I mean, what was the what was the big piece there? Was it what if it's all been a big fat lie in New York Times? No, originally it was um, an article about salt and blood pressure. So I was still living in Los Angeles. Actually, I was back to living in Los Angeles because my <laughs> um, let's just say I went back to LA. Um, the uh, <laughs> I needed to pay my rent one day and I called up my editor at science and I said, do you have a story that I could turn over quickly so I can pay my rent? And then uh -huh. journalism, it's, you know, you basically for a one page article, which might be a thousand words, you interview three sources. That's usually enough. You could write up your thousand word article. You get a thousand dollar paycheck. You pay your rent. Um, yeah. So this was the Dash Diet it was just coming out yeah. in the Journal of Medicine. I didn't realize that um, it had been um, leaked prematurely to science. Um, and I just, my editor said, we have this, this Dash Diet. So, so this is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It's a mostly plant Ugh. diet. Um, not all plants, but mostly plants. And the idea was it lowers blood pressure as much as any, you know, drug does. And the article on it was coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine. My editor sent me the article, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, and a list of people to interview. So normally when you do these stories, you call the principal investigator and you interview him and because the article isn't published yet you ask the pi who else you could talk to who knows about what's in the article and can comment even though it's not been published yet so the pi gives you a couple of names and then you call those names and you write up the story um in this case i had this list of names that my editor had given to me that had been i again i didn't know it had been leaked to science with the paper so I call the PI, I get the story, I call one of the names on the list, and it's a president of the American Heart Association, former president of the American Heart Association, who tells me that she can't talk about the study because um, she'll lose her funding. And I say, it's a diet study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Nobody loses their funding because they talk about it to the press. And she says, I can't do it. And I say, how about if we go off the record, not for attribution, you know, Woodward Bernstein thing, I'll meet you in a garage and, you know, outside your laboratory and you can wear a trench coat and we'll, you know, nobody will know it's you. And she says, absolutely not. And then I call another guy that the principal investigator gave me. And he starts yelling at me that there's no controversy over salt and blood pressure. And I keep saying, but professor, I'm not calling about salt and blood pressure. I'm calling about the DASH diet study that's coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he goes, good, because there's absolutely no controversy over salt and blood pressure. The evidence is unambiguous. Salt causes high blood pressure. So I get off the phone with him and I 
think about it. And I say, call my editor and I say, look, I just had the former president of the American Heart Association telling me she couldn't talk about a diet trial in the New England Journal of Medicine or she'd lose her funding. And then I had this guy in Chicago yelling at me that there's no controversy over salt and blood pressure when I wasn't calling about salt and blood pressure. There must be a controversy about salt and blood pressure that I know nothing about. And I want to find out what it is. And it turned out the DASH diet lowers blood pressure significantly, but doesn't restrict sodium, salt. So this idea that salt causes high blood pressure seemed to be refuted by some level by this diet. And that's why this guy had leaked it to science. I knew nothing about it. I never thought about it like everyone else in America. I was eating a low salt diet. Um, the other issue is a guy in Chicago who was yelling at me, who sounded exactly like the um, old actor Walter Matthau. So you kept thinking Walter Matthau was yelling at you. Um, he was clearly one of the worst scientists I'd ever interviewed in my life. And wow. again, I'd written, you know, two books now about yeah. pathological science. The Cold Fusion book, I thought I had interviewed clearly some of the worst scientists I had ever interviewed because that kind of phenomenon tends to attract bad scientists. But this guy, I thought I could recognize bad scientists by the way they talk about evidence and data. And I still think I can. And regrettably, there's as many who believe what we believe as there are who believe the conventional wisdom. Yeah. But this guy was clearly down there. And I just said, as I said to my editor, if this guy was involved in this controversy in any way, this salt blood pressure story, um, there's got to be a good story there. I don't I have no idea what it is. And so I spent nine months interviewing. I interviewed like 80, 90 researchers, bureaucrats for for one magazine article. At one point, I printed out stacks, three stacks of the major articles in the field. They were about a foot deep, and I sent them off to epidemiologists and biostatisticians I had come to respect who had never been involved in this controversy so they could peer review these papers for me and um, wrote a piece for science called the political, in parentheses, science of salt. And it just turned out that the evidence for this low salt diet was terrible. And it was a kind of a hypothesis that had more or less been refuted by experiments. And um, the community couldn't get away from they, they had fallen in love with their hypothesis. So it didn't matter whether the experiments confirmed it or not, they were going to believe this hypothesis. And um, this Chicago Walter Matthau character, um, not only did he take credit for getting Americans to eat less salt and the low salt dogma, he took Ameri credit for getting Americans to eat less fat. So when I, I told my editor when I'm done writing about salt, I'm going to write about fat. Because again, if he was involved in any way in that story, there's a good story there. And again, I have no idea what the story was. At the time, I was living in L.A. and probably eating a diet that Dean Ornish would think was wonderful. I mean, it was like 20 percent fat diet. And um, so I spent a year on the fat story on a single magazine article on um, wow. about 160 scientists or researchers for one article. Um, clearly did more research on the subject than any human being then alive, including the researchers, and um, the science was terrible. Again, it was one of these things. It's not that you could say for sure that dietary fat didn't cause heart disease, but you sure as hell couldn't say that it did. And the, the data were terrible, and that story was called the soft science of dietary fat. Science ran like 10,000 words. Um, both the salt and the fat stories won major science journalism awards. Um, and they just, at that point, I wanted to write a book about it, but I didn't know. I knew that if I could take a year writing a magazine article, I could take three, four, five years writing a book. And that, you know, I had come out of the Cold Fusion book, which was supposed to be easy money, owing my father $40,000. Well, that was because of Paris, not because of the book. 
<laughs> no, that was because of the book. Um, <laughs> so it's sort of, I financially, I couldn't afford to do the book. So what's ironic is people don't like um, what I conclude from my reporting, accuse me of doing this for the money. And indeed, I you know everyone who has a job does it to some level for the money, but I had to wait to get enough money so I could afford to write a boy, the kind of book I wanted to write. And that happened after I did this New York Times Magazine cover story. And this book was Good Calories, Bad Calories. This was Good Calories, Bad Calories. Yeah. So by this time I was back living in New York, um, would have lunch. Turned out that a young New York Times Magazine editor. This is how these things work. Um, lived in the neighborhood and we both had a favorite lunch spot, which was this French cafe in Greenwich Village. And so we would meet there, you know, once a month and have lunch and talk about, yeah, it was, I miss those days. Uh -huh. Not so much New York, being young in New York. Um, yeah. Young-ish. Oh, uh, younger, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, anyway, we this was two thousand now, and the um, awareness of the obesity epidemic was only about two years old. Um, and while I had been doing the fat story, one of the NIH bureaucrats, uh, scientists I interviewed said, you know, back in 1986, we told the whole country to go on this low fat diet because we thought of nothing else. They'd lose weight because they'd avoid the dense calories of fat. And instead they swapped the fat for carbohydrates and they all got fatter. So I wanted to do, we agreed I would do a story on the, um, what may have caused the obesity epidemic. And, um, the uh i had two hypotheses basically one was this switch from fat to carbs and the other was uh the uh, high fructose corn syrup sort of coming in and dominating the sweetener market and they both happened in the same seven year period of time which kind of coincided with this jump in obesity prevalence and it just turned out that the high fructose corn syrup was interesting, but it's just a kind of a different form of sugar. And if you're going to blame obesity on high fructose corn syrup, you're blaming it on sugar. And that consumption didn't change that much. Although later, I mean, today I might actually blame it on sugar. So anyway, I, I did my usual over-reporting of the story and in the process of doing it, found five clinical trials that had been completed but not yet published testing the Atkins diet, which was keto for all intents and purposes yeah. against the kind of low fat calorie restricted diet that the American Heart Association was telling us all to eat. And in all five of these trials from children to very, you know, uh, subjects who were very suffered from uh, tremendous obesity and diabetes, the Atkins diet did much better, both not just in weight, even though you could eat as much as you want and it wasn't calorie restricted, but in heart disease risk factors. So the, this became the lead of the story and it implicated the carbohydrate hypothesis and weight gain, because basically when you're eating Atkins or keto, you're just abstaining from carbohydrates. And, um, you know, it was the most infamous story of that decade, at least for the New York Times Magazine. I mean, um, everyone who reads the Times and many people who don't remember that story. And it got me a large book deal and changed my life forever. And I finally got to write the book I wanted to write. And that book ended up taking a year longer than I should. So I still ended up in debt afterwards um so wait. how did that change your life though i mean well first of all i got pilloried by the because when you're claiming that the medical research community got something yeah. like this so wrong you're not just going after the medical researchers 
you're going after the journalists who have been faithfully reporting what they've been saying, which included yeah. friends and allies in the field. So, for instance, one of my close friends in science journalism wrote an article in Newsweek, uh, an essay that was called It's Not the Carbs, Stupid, and, you know, targeted at me. The yep. Washington Post uh, nutrition reporter went off and did a hit piece on me in which she interviewed the conventional wisdom people all said I, Taubes is wrong because we disagree with him. It's sort of they argued by assertion, not data. And then she uh, did a hit piece on me that I ended up, you know, having long conversations with the Washington Post uh, masthead, the managing editor at the time, because what she had done seemed to have been so unethical. Um, Columbia Journalism Review did a follow-up piece on our the Washington Post piece. I mean, for a while, I was the most famous, uh, well, clearly the most famous nutrition reporter in the country. And then just this book took over my life because the way reporters typically work and even so when you think about books on diet and nutrition, they're either written by physicians who will talk about their patient's experience and maybe read some of the literature, or they're written by journalists who will interview the physicians um, and the researchers, but rarely, no one had ever really spent the time, not no one, there had been a couple of um, uh exceptions but for the most part no one had really delved into the literature itself let alone set out to interview everyone in the field who had ever done meaningful work on generating this research so again for this book i interviewed five or six hundred researchers and administrators i mean if somebody was alive and coherent and had ever done meaningful research on this, I tracked them down and interviewed them. And to this day, I'm always kind of chagrined and embarrassed when somebody, I find somebody whom I missed. Um, there were people where I ended up talking to the nurses or their hospice nurses who said, I'm sorry, professor so-and-so can't come to the phone anymore. Um, the, um, and meanwhile, the internet had come along and made it possible to find virtually all of, well, it seemed at the time virtually all of the meaningful research and books that nobody had read for 50 or 80 years. Um, I amassed a, a lot of the research was in books that I could buy from used bookstores or conference proceedings that used bookstores around the world would sell for, you know, $7 because who wants a conference wow. proceeding from 1963, but I could chart the history of the field from these conference proceedings. Um, so it gave me an opportunity to do something that had never been done before. And you know, when I'm writing about science, science moves forward because someone has a technology or a, a way of measuring something that nobody's ever had before so they could see something new. And from what they now see, they could come to a different way of thinking about the problem they're studying or a new hypothesis. And the internet basically allowed me to do something, to see things that nobody had seen before. And now it's crazy. Now as I'm still doing the same kind of work, you know, I realize that one of the problems with medicine and this idea of what we don't know is we base our ideas on what we're seeing at the time. And researchers, you know, 50, 80, 100 years ago had very limited access to papers and books and public. I mean, if they wanted to spend their life in their library, they could do it, and many of them would, or they could get the articles from these citation indexes and see what was cited, and you'd print out the articles and the copy machines in the library, and then you'd have stacks on your desk. Nowadays, we can download virtually everything. And if we can't download it, I, I can find where it's being sold by somebody in the world and buy it and have it shipped to me. And so I can see things. We can see almost everything. Whereas they like 
we're all doing a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and they had to guess what was the puzzle was on based on five or 10, or maybe if they were blessed a hundred pieces yeah. and we can get 950 of them. And the problem is, is that all these assumptions were made based on having 10 pieces or 50 pieces. And from those assumptions, belief systems settled in that became dogma. And every that then shaped what everyone else saw. So you get a hypothesis that believe, and then you interpret your data to reconcile it with this hypothesis without realizing that that hypothesis can be wrong. I mean, this is classic bad science, but it happens all the time. So, um, you end up with people like me, journalists, um, perhaps not as mature as I always should be, claiming that the entire medical community has made these terrible mistakes, that your doctor doesn't know what he's doing, that he's giving you the wrong or she is giving you the wrong advice for how to lose weight, how to stay healthy, how to reverse diabetes or, um, you know, pick your disorder and it's always very easier and always a good bet to assume that the people like me are wrong and that the conventional wisdom is right. So you end up with this world where there are these, you know, there are people like me and Nina Teicholz, the major journalists involved, there are bloggers, there are influencers, um, people who moved in from other fields like Rob Wolf, and then there's a whole world of physicians who say, look, when I treat my patients, if I do this, they get healthier. If I do what I'm told to do by these yeah. associations or my government, or I think the dietary guidelines are somehow a good idea to inflict on my patients, they don't get healthier. So what would you do? But we remain a minority. That's the problem. And it's easier to dismiss us. And like I said, usually it's a good bet to dismiss people like me because we're usually wrong. But you're not in this case. Who knows? Every quack. No, you do not. Wrong. I mean, no, I, I have this conversation with uh, uh, one of my very good friends who I think is, was the, um, is, you know, the, the, one of the best scientists that I interviewed in this the nutrition, obesity, chronic disease research field. And he says the same thing. He says, well, but we're not wrong. And no, I say, yeah, yeah, but every quack says, is, says the same thing. Just because you believe it doesn't mean you're not. So how do you tell? But again, the difference here is, you know, physicians are so the physicians' waiting rooms, you know, they're full now of people, especially uh, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, they're, they're, they're kids, adults suffering from some combination of uh, overweight, obesity, you know, pre-diabetes, diabetes, hypertension. So they have trouble controlling their weight. They have trouble controlling their blood sugar. They have trouble controlling their blood pressure. And then they're suffering from all the negative sequelae, the diseases that associate with all of those yeah. lack of control. And again, if the conventional wisdom is either drug therapy, so treat the symptoms, and we have drugs. Yeah. Now we have drugs for overweight. We have drugs for high blood pressure. We have drugs yeah. for high blood sugar. Um, the drugs always get better. That's part of the progression of the field. But the other idea is can I treat this without pills by treating the root causes? And if you switch their diets, so you don't put them on low fat diets or low salt diets, you restrict the carbs and you have them consume a lot of fat. And there may be, you know, it's not about plants or meat. It's about basically um, replacing the carbohydrates with mostly fat and, you know, from real foods and people get healthier. So they're, you know, they're, they're overweight, obesity gets better, goes into remission. They can control their blood sugar. They can control their blood pressure. So that's the ace in our, up our sleeve, which is that people get healthier when they eat yeah. this way. 
Um, the conventional wisdom still says they don't. It's a mistake. In the long run, you're going to kill people. So the idea is I have a patient who's 400 pounds, 200 pounds overweight, um, high blood pressure. They're on blood pressure medications, blood sugar medications. I've been telling them for years to eat less and exercise. Now I put them on keto for you know low carb, high fat diet. They, they lose 200 pounds. And I'm supposed to think that they're killing themselves. They can yeah. get off their blood sugar medications and their blood pressure. And I'm supposed to think they're killing themselves because they're eating saturated fat or, you yeah. know, red meat or eggs. Um, and anything's possible, but I know where I'd bet. Oh, for I sure. I have bet. You have I'm, bet. Very, yeah. very like you've drawn a line in the sand for sure. Gary, I just want to do a time check. I know we are at the hour that I set for us. Can we finish up or do we? Is well, let's it? talk about the subject. So what don't we know and why don't we know? It? What <laughs> yeah, what don't we know and why don't we know it? <laughs> okay. So we have all these hypotheses about the nature of a healthy diet. That's a general thing. So we want to be healthy. We want to remain healthy as long as we can. And, you know, maybe we want to die quickly once we don't want, but we're not getting into that. We just want to, how do I eat to be healthy? And I don't know how your other uh, interviews ease, how they defined um, health, but so I want to minimize chronic disease. I want to have energy. I want to be physically active. I want to sleep well, all these things. Um, I want to be on a minimal, minimum number of pharmaceuticals, ideally none. Um, the minimizing chronic disease is an issue, right? Because that's chronic diseases develop over years to decades. Um, and yeah. so, you know, again, if you th think of nutrition, I like to say sometimes when I'm angry at science, say, say nutritionists, I'll say, let's pretend this is a real science, okay? So we have a hypothesis in science, if nothing else is hypothesis and test, and we want to test the hypothesis. So the hypothesis is if I eat this way, a mostly plant diet, I will live longer and be healthier than if I eat a mostly meat diet and animal products, um, every, all other things being equal. So, you know, we're going to make it a healthier plant. So we're going to get rid of the sugar and the white bread and versus meat. So how do I, that's my hypothesis, which is that the mostly plant diet is a healthier diet. How do I test it? Yeah. And it's not enough to do a one year study because we're not interested in whether this is a healthy diet for a year we're interested in whether this is a healthy diet for a lifetime so we need to be able to see chronic diseases develop on one diet versus the other and it takes you know years to decades for chronic diseases to develop even if as most of us become overweight and obese it tends to happen over years to decades it doesn't happen overnight possible exception of the freshman year in college. Um, so now we have to do the clinical trials long enough yeah. to see chronic diseases develop, long enough to see. It's not enough to just say, look, I saw your LDL cholesterol go up, and LDL cholesterol is associated with heart disease risk, so I can assume that you're going to have a higher rate of heart disease because your LDL may have gone up, but it may have gone up in association, as it will, with low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diets with blood yeah. pressure and blood sugar and weight coming down. So we don't know how they'll balance out. It's not enough to just measure LDL. You've got to look at what are called hard endpoints. Yeah. So I, I, you do the numbers, you find out that if I want to study this hypothesis that a plant-based diet is healthier, I need to take like 10,000 people and randomize them to either a plant-based diet or an animal product-based diet. And then I have to keep them on those diets long enough for these hard endpoints, heart disease, diabetes, diagnoses, um, you know, hypertension to show up. 
and that could be five to 10 years on average because you've got a lot of people. And now you've got a study that's going to cost 20, 30, 40 million dollars. And it's very difficult to do because one of the problems is keeping them on the diet. Like the people on the animal product based diet, they might think they're hearing all this stuff that they're in a study testing the hypothesis that plant based diets are healthier. So they may start eating plant based diets, even though you're trying to get them to eat animals or the people on the plant-based diet might think, oh my God, I'm supposed to eat this plant-based diet, but I'm getting fatter and fatter and I don't want to get fat. And I know people are randomizing the animal product diet and they're getting thin. So I'm going to eat like they are Yeah. or some combination of no idea. So these studies are incredibly hard to do. Mm -hmm. And the medical research, nutrition, public health community funded some of these back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they tended to refute their hypotheses. So they stopped funding the studies. Whenever they do fund the studies, they almost invariably refute their hypotheses, um, which is very interesting, uh, but a longer subject. So one of the fundamental problems with the nutrition world is you've got these hypotheses that say, hypothetically, you should eat this way. You know, you should eat a low fat diet. The World Health Organization just came out with reports in July where they're still pushing low fat diets. Um, That means a high carb diet, even for weight. And you should eat mostly plants and you should avoid red meat and processed meat because there's terrible evidence that they increase the risk of colon cancer a little bit. Um, And if you eat this way, you'll be healthier. That's the story. So it's sort of, and we don't know, you know, again, anything's possible. Clearly the world is full of people who eat plant-based diets and are very healthy, but that doesn't mean they're healthy because they eat the plant-based diets. And it doesn't mean they wouldn't be healthier still if they ate like you and I did assuming you eat as technically unhealthy a diet as I do. Oh, Um, yes, absolutely. The world is full of people. Another way to look at it is, um, and this is a typical way of thinking in the field, both, again, on our side and on their side, is um, if you're lean and healthy and health conscious, you tend to eat, follow the guidelines that you're given. So you'll eat, you know, a a diet that's full of plants and, you know, whole grains and legumes and fruits. And um, if you have a lot of fish and uh, skinless chicken breasts and, um, and then you think, well, I'm lean and healthy and I eat this diet. Clearly this diet is helping me be lean and healthy. So you associate what you're eating is you turn it into a causal hypothesis and suddenly it becomes that's a healthy diet that everyone should eat. And one of the issues I discussed in uh, my book, The Case for Keto, is, you know, we've been getting this sort of lean person's diet advice throughout. I mean, it, it used to be like it's the lean doctors who feel they can give advice. Um, this is different. What happened with Atkins in the 1960s, it was kind of the first time that you had a doctor who said, I used to be fat. I'm not any, actually it wasn't the very first diet book in the 1860s. That was a bestseller. It was the same thing. But you have two choices. You have people who used to be obese, suffer from obesity, who have lost it. They can give advice. Um, I'm going to say three choices. You can have physicians who aren't don't suffer from obesity themselves, but treat patients that way they can give advice. Or you can have lean people give advice because the lean people think whatever they're doing must be right. right? They're lean and healthy, so we should all eat like they do. The world is full of these young athletic physical trainers who have absolutely no trouble maintaining a healthy weight who say we should eat like they do because look at how healthy they are. It drives me crazy. Yeah, it's a little annoying. Um, The alternative is those of us who struggle with our weight, our blood pressure, our blood sugar cannot eat like lean, healthy people do. That there's something about the way those people eat that triggers our problem. Yeah. 
So we have to eat differently. Yeah. But this is a kind of obvious possibility, right or wrong, that the medical community refuses to accept. It's weird. They talk about personalized medicine. They talk about how everyone's different. But if you say something like what works for you doesn't work for me. And so I have to do something different and you should be good with that because I've found what works for me. They, what is it? They go DEFCON 5 on you or something. You know, now the idea is, well, if you're doing something differently, you're surely killing yourself in some other way. You yeah. Know? So that's the message, the LDL, cholesterol, saturated fat story. If you're eating a lot of, uh, you know, animal products, you're eating a lot of saturated fat because they're found naturally in animal products. So it doesn't matter how healthy you get and how good you feel. Now you're killing yourself because of the saturated fat and the animal products you're eating. And then you say things like, well, look, the French, the Swiss, they've always been yeah. the, among the two of the three longest lived populations in the world. Uh, they eat high, high animal fat diets. I mean, they live on cheese and dairy. I lived in Butter. Geneva. I told you. I mean, you have to yeah. eat fondue and raclette at every cocktail party. Raclette is melted cheese on a plate with little cornichons, and little pickles, and onions. Delicious. I like fondue. Raclette, I could now. I probably like raclette better now too. But um, anyway, it's just the these belief systems are resistant to negative evidence. There's nothing you could show people who have grown up believing something and being taught that this is true by their, um, their uh, mentors and something that everyone in their peer group and their professional group believes. It's very hard to just give them evidence and say, look, I explained the French. Actually, I once did this with a researcher. I think it was at Boston College. Uh -huh. And he said, no, no, the French eat low-fat diets. I what? Was like, yeah, no, that was my response. Have you ever lived in France, dude? Have you visited? <laughs> I was crazy. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. The other problem, let me just read about what well, we don't know and why we don't know it. Yeah. Fundamental challenge of all sciences is you have two observations. Something happens and an effect. Yeah. Or something happens and something else happens. And these things are associated in some way and the challenges to figure out if that association is causal. Yeah. Does... Um, Hold on one sec while I play with my screen here, which is so, you know, uh, I'm in New York City. Uh, as soon as it starts to rain, a lot of people open umbrellas. Maybe they open umbrellas before it starts to rain. Does the rain cause the umbrellas to open or do the umbrellas cause the rain? Or are, is there no connection between them and maybe something else is happening? Like uh, there was a news report that we're going to be bombarded by, you know, gamma rays from the sun. And if you have an umbrella, that'll protect you. And that news report comes out and the umbrellas go up and the rain happens. But and the gamma rays actually trigger the rain. I mean, who knows? Anything wow. is possible. The fact that two things are associated doesn't tell you which causes which or whether one is the cause of another or whether there is, are other causes beneath that. And that's what the job of science is to discover on some level. You make an observation. We want to know what causes it. And the mechanisms involved and the fact that the, the these two phenomena are associated in time or space or statistically doesn't tell you anything about what the which is cause and which is effect if either um in this world nutrition obesity public health and again there's this problem on both sides so we have allies who think this people don't seem to understand that concept 
it's very hard not to think this happened and that happened. The umbrellas opened. It started to rain. Yeah. <laughs> Opening umbrellas causes rainfall. And it sounds, when I phrase it like that, it makes it sound like it's obvious and naive, but it happens all the time yeah. in this world. And this field of uh, observation of epidemiology that I first wrote about in 1994 or five, that was the reason for the electromagnetic field thing, managed to evolve and to mature without the epidemiologist fully understanding all the ways that the associations they were seeing could be created by the methodology of their field of their discipline, like the same way the detectors I talked about in the physics experiment at CERN in 1985 could fool the physicists into seeing something that isn't real. Um, the surveys and associations can fool the epidemiologists. And then that's led to, that was a lot of the idea behind, you know, the idea we should eat low fat diets. And then, yeah. you, so associations generate hypotheses any of them could be correct. Again, it's like, you know, very hard to rule anything out. If I said that it rains because Martians make it rain, sounds absurd, but who knows, could be true. The question is, can we test it? Yeah. And if we can test it, then it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. Um, the, uh, the most of what we believe about nutrition is dominated by these association studies. People who eat this way tend to live longer than people who eat that way. There's now the blue um, zone phenomenon. I was just thinking about that when you said it. Well, there's two aspects of the blue zone phenomenon. Oh. Um, but, you know, people in these isolated pockets of the world tend to live very long, healthy lives. So we are going to assume that they live long, healthy lives because of all these factors of their lifestyle that associate with them. And then we're yeah. going to tell everyone else to live that way. Yeah. And again, now we have another hypothesis. Our hypothesis is if everyone else lives that way, they will live longer because living this way is associated with longevity in these populations. So an association generates a hypothesis which can then be tested. The problem is, again, the tests are very hard to do. They take years, decades. It take, can take five years just to set up this kind of experiment. And then it's going to cost you $50 million. And then you might screw it up and have to repeat yeah. it, and repeat it, and repeat it. So people don't bother with the tests. They just say, we're going to believe the associations. And our world is full of people, like I said, you know, who basically say this is associated with that. I think you should believe it's causal. So, so you should do this instead of that. And, you know, on some level, if it makes you feel better in the short run, if you can improve your symptoms and you're pretty confident, and here's where it gets tricky, that because the world is full of pharmaceuticals and performance enhancing drugs and, you know, mind enhancing drugs that will make you yeah. feel better in the short run and will cause long-term harm. Yeah. So, you know, the, the message is, is an extraordinary amount of stuff that we don't know and that have never been tested in the way that we need them to be tested. I said, the reason I argue for the case for keto in this book is you eat this way, you'll get healthier without taking any drugs or supplements or, you know, pharmaceuticals. We can mostly believe that if you're getting healthier by removing carbs from your diet and sugar from your diet, that that is going to make you healthier and you're going to live longer. And But again, it's I also acknowledge that I'm there's no way to know if I'm right. So as long as you continue to feel healthy, then this is a good thing, but will it make you live longer? Who knows? And um, the ultimate example I could say, so I've been on some version of a ketogenic diet for 20 years now, since I wrote that New York Times magazine story and kind of realized not just 
how much healthier I was and felt when I eat this way, how lean, much leaner I was, but also I began to understand the science behind it. Um, I'm now much to my dismay, 67 years old. Let's say I live for another 10 years and I die at 77. We have no idea whether my diet killed me prematurely or extended my life. Okay, so maybe if I hadn't switched and I was on the conventional wisdom, by now I'd be on five different medications, yeah. but I'm still going to die at 72. We don't know. Maybe had I switched, had I not switched, I'd have lived to be 93 like my father did. We don't know. And because I did switch, there's no point. There's no information given. The universe doesn't give us any information about whether the diet made us live longer or shorter. All it tells us is whether it makes us feel better and whether it makes us healthier by these very important measures, which are, you know, weight control, blood sugar control, blood pressure control. I mean, you could throw in dozens of others, but those are the major ones. Um, that we know. And then any, you don't need a randomized control trial to tell you, you can just test it yourself. That's the message of symposium like yours is like, and maybe all these people are crazy. If you have been struggling with your weight and you're tired of taking your diabetes medications and your blood pressure medications and tell your doctor you're gonna experiment with this, ask him to watch over the medications because you're probably gonna to have to come off them and then do the experiment and see what happens because that you can know without all these other things that science can tell you getting in the way. This is the perfect way to end, unless you have another way to end. I absolutely love what you've just said. I appreciate everything that you've done to get us all to this point, because without your work, none of us would be here, right? I wouldn't be having this conversation. I wouldn't be having these interviews. I wouldn't be putting on the summit. So um, I'm deeply grateful to you. You have, you are a phenomenal human and a wonderful friend. Um, and, uh, and I'm blessed. The first time, I don't know if you remember the first time you ever speak to me, spoke to me. I was a little South African phoning you from Cape Town, talking about I the think sugar. You me from Florida. I was in Florida, but I was living in Cape Town. But we were, yes, right. you're right. I was in Florida on vacation. <laughs> it was, um, it, it was odd. But it worked out. It worked out. <laughs>